colleague of mine called uh, um, Yasmin Lam from McGill University, uh, and I uh, uh, thought about what kind of a contribution we could make to uh, the AU's 50th anniversary, uh, which was uh, late May uh, 2013. And knowing that I was always a critic of the African Union and by extension various regional economic communities, we said this time maybe we need to be uh, uh, a little more positive and see what kind of a contribution we can make. And therefore we did co-author uh, uh, this piece, which has already been published uh, by an online journal called the Horn of Africa Bulletin by the Life and Peace Institute in Uppsala, Sweden on uh, uh, crafting foreign policy in a supranational organization, which is more of an analysis of the European Union, its structures and so on, and, and see what lessons we can draw for the African Union. And to start with, while the role of supranational regional institutions to enhance economic integration has long been uh, uh, accepted, its role in crafting foreign policy is still to date uh, contested. Uh, basically because of issues of sovereignty, because it's like you are surrendering your sovereignty to this supranational organization as opposed to holding on to it. But by, by trying to, uh, uh, not completely, but somehow defying the international relations realist perspective, that the primary goal of states is to preserve sovereignty, states also do uh, in fact have different preferences when achieving their own foreign policy objectives. And in this case, some would want to surrender uh, all of it or at some point partial. And in this way, I'll be looking at uh, the European Union uh, uh, and the African Union because both institutions were created to uh, enhance the means towards achievement of um, common objectives of their member states they may be different in terms of their power capabilities, uh, but the two cases are worth comparing. And in this case, um, we will um, uh, look at the EU's trajectory and then start drawing uh, some lessons for the AU, which is in a way on the road uh, and the path to crafting a concerted foreign policy beyond its current security and defense policy, which is already intact. Uh, in both unions, Policies have been enacted to identify strategic interests. Um, but by looking at the, Af the European Union, you have the Common Foreign uh, Security Policy uh, from 1992, um, and it serves, that serves as the guiding policy for its 27 member states. Uh, it kind of provides principles and guidelines to uh, set uh, a general political direction. It also sets a common uh, strategy to achieve those objectives, but also helps draft joint actions for implementation in specific situations. And other than the most recent uh, uh, discussions over the Syrian uh, 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 crisis in support of the, uh, the rebels, I think they have been throughout uh, uh, time, I think, uh, unified in their position. In the AU side, we have the Common African Defense Security Policy, which is more of a broader policy to serve the same goal. However, it's the Peace and Security Council of the AU created in 2004, which is more of the instrument to implement this defense uh, uh, policy. Um, and it's going to be the key agent in terms of uh, pushing for an AU common foreign policy in the future. And in this case, while they are interrelated, they are somehow different in, in nature. So I will look at two broad areas in terms of my uh, comparison and, and the lessons I'll be drawing. One area is the rationale for member states to really engage in such, and the other one is the institutional design. And we will bo bo look at uh, more on the EU, but we'll also look at the African Union in terms of drawing lessons for uh, and from the EU. And under the rationale for member states, I think the first important rationale is economic interests. The EU finds itself better positioned uh, in terms of pursuing a common foreign policy for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, its original initiation as a regional institution was to enhance economic integration between and among its member states because this curated high 
uh, uh, mutual interdependence, mainly an internal uh, throughout the process. And its success as an economic bloc has allowed it to stake its stance and presence in the international system as an indispensable economic actor. Of course, the most recent Eurozone crisis uh, uh, aside. This has also allowed them to be engaged in an incremental process of institutional building. Uh, on the other hand, um, economic integration within the African Union is yet to be strengthened. Um, we have the African Economic Community, which is set out to promote uh, uh, that key objective, but this is yet to be realized, basically because of uh, widespread problems such as poverty in the continent, unfortunately, which continues to be a key challenge. But while economic integration is very weak within the African Union, it is an ongoing process uh, uh, that will really prove to be fruitful once it's realized. So you can see what can be drawn from that. Another area, uh, in addition to the economic interest is under the rationale, is the preference for regional governance, which uh, um, in the EU case was specifically uh, 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 done, but it has some specific implications for the African Union because of its success in developing a foreign policy. For Africa, there is a generally a more conservative attitude towards sovereignty and the whole issue of um, uh, surrendering it, either in, in its, its entirety or, or, or partial. And as such, there is some kind of a reluctance to devolve power, which is very widespread in the EU uh, case, but very difficult uh, in the African context to regional levels. And this may hinder the willingness of member states to conform to the development of an AU foreign policy, unless they do that. A third equally interesting area, which is under the rationale, is that of identity. Uh, where member states do not have a strong regional governance, uh, one finds, and this is within the European context, more Europeanized identities, which increases the probability that governments prefer a supranational foreign and security policy. But when the African Union was originally conceived, the backbone of the institution was based on the idea of Pan-Africanism, which is a very strong identity based on that all Africans have a spiritual affinity uh, with each other and that having suffered together in the past under colonialism and other forms of hardships, they must also march together into a new and brighter future. And this wide agreement of African leaders to shape the institution on, on Pan-Africanism, I think you will all agree with me, reflects an unwavering Pan-African identity among its member states, which is more or less in, in parallel and, and similar to that of the Europeanized identities, and therefore can increase the probability of African governments preferring a supranational foreign security policy. Another area which is worth looking at, in addition to the rationality, is that of institutional design in terms of uh, structures and so on. And one area under that is membership. Uh, in both the European Union and the African Union, the decision-making process involves groups that are small in size in order to, uh, to incentivize each member state to contribute. Now, the main decision-making body within the European Union involves the 27 member states. In comparison, however, and contrary to that, you have 54 member states in the African context. However, a decision was made to create the Peace and Security Council, which would be more of a smaller committee comprising an equal number of member states from each of Africa's five regions, east, west, north, south, but also central. The professor was calling it middle in the morning. And overall, the formation of small-sized decision-making group enhances, of course, the likelihood of reacting and reaching their collective aim. Uh, in addition to membership, I think decision-making process and socialization is another area. And when it comes to deciding on a policy, the EU and the AU differ on the requirement of consensus. In the EU context, consensus is mandatory. Uh, and it allots veto power to each member state. But in the, EU's peace and in the AU's Peace and Security Council, majority rule by two-thirds is sufficient. Now, unanimity requirement as displayed in the EU, may be more beneficial. Of course, it has implications on the socialization uh, effect. And, and socialization, we can describe it as the interactive process in which different actors uh, learn appropriate behavior held by different communities and, and actors within those communities. 
And in this case, through increased interaction bef between member states uh, in the African Union, just like they are in the European Union, norms and principles of what's appropriate are also becoming internalized in the institution. And therefore, an adoption of the EU's unanimity requirement may therefore further deepen this kind of uh, decision-making process, but also socialization, creating a set of institutional norms and a collective worldview that can enhance future cooperation in foreign policy making. A third equally interesting area <coughs> under the institutional design is that of power autonomy. Lastly, for a supranational uh, organization like that of the either the European Union or the African Union to be effective, it must be examined whether the organization can become a source of autonomous power outside other competing powers and interests, whereby such an institution becomes very autonomous from member states that created uh, um, the, the entity. And once it's able to do so, they can classify the world, they can uh, create categories of factors and action, they can fix meanings in the social world, and therefore articulate but also diffuse ideas, norms, principles, and so on around the globe. And in order to achieve such a huge but ambitious goal, such an entity must develop legitimacy and technocratic capabilities and it's then for such an organization that it can become a significant player in world politics. Now by looking at the European Union, uh, it has been able to achieve such level of power autonomy from its member states. For example, if you look at key individuals like Cathy Ashton, the uh, high representative, the EU uh, kind of foreign policy chief, has been very crucial in mediating discussions and fostering consensus, and she stands out as personnel uh, of the EU rather than anyone representative from a member state, in this case, uh, the UK's representative in the EU, etc. Furthermore, the European Union stands as a prestigious institution attracting high-skilled uh, international bureaucrats as their employees. In the AU uh, case, uh, insufficient resources and commitment from the member states has been the case and the problem, which lessens uh, the required capability to develop such autonomous power at the AU level. It's also underfunded, the AU is also underfunded, with the majority of its contributions coming from non-AU partners abroad. And this bring is, brings in issues of donor-driven thinking and, and projects and programming rather than an AU thing. Moreover, there is also a lack of an impartial individual such as Cathy Ashton in the AU context, unfortunately. Now, creating AU exclusive personnel with high power authority could definitely enhance the capacity for the AU to develop power autonomy. And in addition to this, the United Nations is given a substantive role in making a final decision over sanctioning AU-led interventions, which may sometimes detract some independency from the AU in making decisions for Africa. I think the Libyan case is a classical case when the AU could not even vis visit Tripoli and Benghazi, and they had to get uh, cleared from Brussels basically because the, the, AU, the, AU, the EU was in charge and the AU was not. Uh, in conclusions, uh, we've kind of examined the EU and the AU to shed more light on how such an institution can craft a coherent foreign policy. Um, firstly, we looked at the rationale. We also looked at the institutional uh, design. And through this comparison, although very brief, we can go into details during the question and answer session, it's found that the AU has an advantage in its strong African identity and in the membership structure of its Peace and Security Council. Nevertheless, a number of uh, lessons can be drawn, mainly four. To begin with, the strong economic power of the European Union, through tremendous efforts in deepening integration between its members, has built up, uh, built up its capacity to stand as a significant player in the international arena. This foundation has also served as the base on which the EU can utilize different tools at its disposal to develop a coherent foreign and security policy, very common. For the AU now, the goal toward strengthening economic integration in Africa is essential before it can even develop a robust foreign policy. A second equally interesting lesson the AU can learn from the EU is that as African states strengthen their governance, heads of states may be more comfortable in devolving some aspects of sovereignty to a supranational organization, in this case, into the African Union. 
And while this is not a necessary condition or more of a precondition, it will cer certainly increase the overall likelihood of support for the development of one unified African foreign policy. So there is need for that courageous move to do so. Thirdly, the African Union can benefit from adopting the European Union's unanimity requirement in terms of its decision-making processes. This would allow for increased socialization between its member states, developing a common African Union approach, uh, norm and principles that are shared and internalized in the institution. With the development of an institutional norm, the likelihood of the formation of a coherent foreign policy is also increased. The more you interact, the more you can dialogue and engage and, and, and also uh, kind of push for the buy-in strategy. Lastly, with increased investment and commitment of member states into the institution uh, and, and less dependence on external aid for that matter, uh, will create a cadre of AU technocrats. It will also give the, Euro the African Union the capacity to shape the entity into a source of power, power autonomy, and that uh, uh, process also enhanced. The African Union can therefore become an organization independent from the United Nations and other entities with the ability to advance its own foreign policy to meet the objectives and interests of its member states. All in all, the African Union, I believe, and my colleague agrees with me, is on the path towards developing the capability to articulate a range of foreign policy for its member states. And although it's not without its share of challenge, just like any other supranational organization, just like the, Af the European Union too faces hurdles in achieving consensus, and I already talked about the Syrian case very uh, recently, the establishment of one unified African policy we lend, definitely lend the continent, a strengthened and assertive voice on the global platform. When that can be achieved, I think Africa will also become a political and economic powerhouse in the international arena. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop there. <laughs>